I am joined by Mark Cabana, head of U.S. rate strategy at B of A Global Research. Mark, great to have you on Forward Guidance. Welcome. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate you having me. Appreciate you. So you have a lot of experience, uh, close to a decade working at the Federal Reserve on financial stability, as well as implementing quantitative easing. Of course, now you're a, a rate strategist. So you've got a lot of experience in the bond market. When you look at the bond market right now, uh, of the afternoon of July 18th, what stands out to you? Is it fair to say it's quite different from a sort of normal bond market? Yeah, it's very different from the bond markets that at least I've known since growing up in the fixed income world and uh, joining at the Fed in 2007. Uh, Two things stand out in this bond market today. One, the rate level. We're at really the highest rate levels that we have seen in almost two decades. And two, the shape of the curve. We're at the most inverted that we have been in decades. Uh, And both of these are quite unusual, given the recent history that we've had in the bond market that had much lower rate levels and uh, typically upward sloping yield curves, uh, or if they were inverted, those inversions were much shallower. Yes, the bond market inversions, yield curve inversions, uh, frequently have preceded recessions in the U.S., led led many uh, economists to predict last year that the U.S. economy would be in a recession right now. And the resilience of the U.S. economy has uh, surprised many uh, economists, leaving aside the economic impact of why, you know, uh, how of of an inverted yield curve in the funding markets, in the repo markets and in the bond investing markets that that you traffic in. What uh, is different about an inverted curve? What's kind of uh, what are the different incentive structures that make it a little bit different? Well, I think the biggest difference is that your funding costs when you're in an inverted curve are typically above uh, the levels that uh, the bond market is yielding out the curve. So you're paying up potentially to borrow today to lock in a lower yielding asset. Uh, You're locking in negative carry. Uh, That's a very different environment. Typically, most investors would be borrowing and in a normally or upward sloping yield curve, borrowing at relatively low, short dated rates and investing out the curve and picking up a higher yield. Uh, So it really does change the calculus of uh, how investors are behaving. And if you want to borrow at an elevated rate and lock in a lower rate, you need to have great confidence that that rate's going to be moving lower. So yield down price up in order to justify those borrowing costs. Uh, Another thing that we see with the inverted uh, shape of the curve is that there's been a lot of inflows into relatively short dated mutual funds or investment structures. Money market mutual funds are taking in a lot of inflows. Short dated fixed income has seen a lot of inflows as well. And that's simply because other investors are asking themselves, well, why would I be extending out the curve when the highest yield that I can get today is at the very front end of the curve? So it's a different dynamic in terms of how investment activity has worked. And this does have broader implications throughout the economy, especially for entities like banks. Um, you know, banks have to pay up to retain funds today, um, especially given that some of the relatively low yielding deposits have left for higher yielding alternatives elsewhere. Right. That makes sense. So looking from a Bank of America Global Research Fund Survey and the biggest concern of, of uh, investors that were surveyed in April of 2023 was financial stability and fragile financial markets. 38% of, of participants said that was their biggest concern. And now in July, it was 11%. So we've really seen the, uh, a lot of worry come out of, of the market. I guess, what were the fears of what would happen during the sort of, uh, bank pressures that happened in March and, and somewhat April? And why, you know, if, if it's possible to know, have they not appeared? Yeah, well, the biggest differences between the spring and, let's say, the summer are that in the spring, we did see great concern about banking system stability, uh, resilience, safety, and soundness. And these concerns were triggered by the failure of a couple of relatively good-sized banks. Obviously, there was Silicon Valley Bank. Signature Bank, and then First Republic, all who failed um, within either one weekend or a couple of months from each other. And uh, this was a surprise to many. 
Um, it was seen as uh, monetary policy and the inverted yield curve finally starting to bite in terms of the at least banking system. And uh, there were questions as to whether or not there might be additional banks that would come under pressure and potentially be at risk of failure. Uh, so that was the real concern about financial stability at the time of the survey that you just cited. Today, um, we are in a better place, uh, and we're in a better place because it seems like, well, we've had more time to assess how other banks have behaved. We went through Q1 earnings. We're just in the early stages of Q2 earnings right now. So we're getting a better look at banks and how they've been able to adapt to not only a higher rate environment, but an inverted curve environment. And we have also seen how banks have tried to adjust to just the higher overall funding rate environment that they face today. Um, right after uh, the failures of the banks in the spring, you saw many banks pay up to acquire relatively high cost, stable sources of financing that could be through paying up to get deposits in the brokered CD market, let's say, or paying up to get funding from the federal home loan banks and the federal home loan banking system. And what we've seen today is that some of the precautionary funding that was taken out in the spring has been paid down to some extent. And that's a generally reassuring sign for investors. So I do think that time as well as banks ability to adapt to this different funding environment have both contributed in the reduction of concern about financial sector stability at least at the moment right so people think a lot about the fed as a big lender to banks but actually it's the federal home loan bank that is, is doing a lot of the lending and i, I think the numbers uh, are something like 300 billion uh, of new bond issuance from the federal home loan bank in order to fund advances to banks, which are loans to banks. Um, and then you said uh, something like 200, around 200, 250 billion has, has been paid back roughly. Yeah, that's right. So uh, when we were assessing uh, banking system stress, we really looked at three key things, at least from a funding market perspective. Number one, federal home loan bank activity. Number two, emergency Fed lending activity. And number three, money market fund inflows. Now, on the first thing that we monitor, the federal home loan bank activity, remember the federal home loan bank system is essentially, uh, well, they frequently call themselves or academic research has called themselves the lender of second to last resort, the Fed being the lender of last resort. But they have that description because they are essentially a bank for commercial banks. Their mission is to promote mortgage lending activity and community investment activity. They do that by providing reasonably low cost and stable sources of loans to banks so that they can then fulfill that mission. And when banks need funding, they can call the home loans and tap that readily source of funding that is available. Now, when we track home loan activity, we're most interested in how many loans are the home loan system making to commercial banks? The problem is that that data is lagged. We only get it once a quarter. So instead of uh, using that lag data, we look at debt issuance from the federal home loan bank system because we assume that home loans are issuing debt to then make advances. And we think it's a better real-time indicator of home loan activity. And what we have seen is that from early March, pre-SVB failure, to the end of May, the Federal Home Loan Bank system increased their debt outstanding by about $300 billion. This is roughly a 20% increase in the total amount of debt outstanding that they had. But since the end of May through today, the vast majority, over 80% of that has been paid down. Um, something like last time I checked, $250 billion out of that $300 billion had been paid down. So that's a clear indication to us that some of the home loan borrowing, some of the home loan advances and debt that was associated with that was likely done for precautionary purposes. And that is indeed an encouraging indicator about the resilience of the banking system at the moment. 
The other things that we look at, as I mentioned, Fed emergency lending. The Fed made a lot of discount window loans. They introduced a new facility called the Bank Term Funding Program um, that made a lot of loans. But that activity has really slowed down. Um, and if anything, it may have peaked to some extent. At least the Fed's BTFP program may have peaked. That's encouraging. And the third thing that we watched was money market mutual fund inflows. And those have continued, uh, but not at such a rapid pace that we saw in the immediate aftermath of those bank failures. So on net, there are encouraging signs from the funding market as it relates to bank stability. And if they hold, uh, then I think that uh, the Fed will at least have more confidence that the banking system is indeed resilient and sound. Uh, and that shouldn't be a material consideration for them in the setting of monetary policy and their fight to get inflation down. Thank you. What did you think of the bank term funding program? You know, I think it was on a Friday that Silicon Valley Bank failed. And on that weekend, a Saturday, perhaps you had some thoughts of, oh, what is the Federal Reserve going to do something? And then when the, uh, the Sunday, the Federal Reserve came out with the uh, FDIC and Treasury and made this announcement, was it uh, pretty much your expectations? You're like a oh, classic Fed or did, uh, were you expecting something else? We thought that the official sector had to act. And they had to act because we were worried about signs of contagion in the market. If this bank goes down, how might that impact another bank? And if deposits can leave quickly from bank A, why can't they leave quickly from bank B? So we did think that there would be some type of official sector response to try and stop that contagion, to try and stop the bank run fear. Because as you know, the destabilizing thing about bank runs is that they can be irrational, they can move quickly, and banks can find that if their name is in the crosshairs, then there can be a very large outflow of deposits from that institution. What they thought were stable deposits can quickly turn into flighty deposits. So the official sector acted to guaranteed depositors, uh, and they acted by rolling out the bank term funding program. Um, and the bank term funding program, we did think was a very valuable tool because it allowed banks to turn their very high quality assets that they held into cash at relatively attractive terms with the Fed. Um, and this prevented the need for banks to fire sell some of those assets in the open market and not only thus put upward pressure on existing treasury or mortgage rate levels, but realize potentially deep losses on some of the securities that those institutions held. So we did think that the bank term funding program was a very effective tool for the Fed to deploy um, and mitigate some of the risks about uh, insufficient bank uh, ability to generate liquidity and uh, for banks to sustain potentially quite substantial losses um, on any forced sales of securities. Yeah, and uh, kind of maybe taking advantage of the inverted yield curve by letting banks borrow one year in advance and refinance. Yeah, well, I mean, so they were able to fund these. Uh, well, the, the bank term funding program had two key tenants in terms of uh, the uh, amount of funding and the cost of funds that were available to banks. Number one, banks were able to fund securities at par. So if a security was trading at 95 instead of the $100 par, the Fed would say, well, look, I know that the security, it's high quality, it's a treasury, let's say, and you can fund it with me at 100. Um, and even though it's only trading at 95, um, I'll still give you $100 for it because I know it is money good. Uh, the second thing that the Fed did to increase the attractiveness of the BTFP was to offer uh, below market rates, essentially. The Fed allowed uh, the banks to borrow at one-year Fed funds OIS plus 10 basis points. And given the inverted shape of the yield curve, one-year OIS was quite substantially below current market rates. So it was... Um, a very attractive financing option for the banks, not only because of the low market rate, but because of the full par value that was able to be financed with the Fed. Thanks. So you uh, talked about Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, Bank Term Funding Program, Fed things. The third thing you mentioned was the money market funds. I, I know there has been quite a migration uh, from uh, bank deposits into money market funds. 
Uh, but I did when you made that comment. Did you say that actually you're you're seeing some good news on that front? Well, we've seen that at least the very sharp pace of inflows into money funds right after SVB has moderated. There continue to be inflows into money market mutual funds, which is understandable. If you've got a almost zero uh, yielding deposit and you can earn over 5% in a money fund, it's not a very complicated trade, assuming that you're comfortable with the liquidity difference between the two instruments and that you're willing to sign up for that money fund. Uh, so what we have seen is that the pace of money fund inflows has moderated which uh, we do think is encouraging. We also see signs that even though the money comes into a money market mutual fund, um, it's getting recycled within the banking system. So a money fund is either buying a treasury that's then being used to have the treasury department provide that to another depositor and stay in the financial system, or it's coming out of a bank and then going into the home loan system um, and that being used to provide advances. So we're not seeing signs that the cash that's moved into money funds is necessarily leaving in like a flight to quality away from the banks. It's just being recycled through a different vehicle or potentially through another vehicle that the banks can then obtain access to if they're willing to pay up in order to get those funds, i.e. think home loan advance. So uh, a bank deposit leaving the banking system going to the money market fund, if that money market fund 100% buys a treasury, then that money stays in the banking system and if it buys a federal home loan uh, uh, note or, or discount uh, bond, that stays in the system. But the issue is if it goes into the Fed's reverse repo facility, what happens then? Then it leaves the banking system. And that's what we were watching to see if there was a flight to quality out of certain types of deposits into money funds and then out of the banking system. And we did not see that, which was very encouraging. We saw that the money was staying within the banking system. It was just getting moved around um, and it was going through different channels to then find its way back into a potential bank deposit. Like let's say you, you, know, you thought you were in a troubled bank. We'll call that bank name you know, Bank A. So you took your money out of Bank A. You moved it into a money market mutual fund. If that money fund then took your money and lent it to the federal home loan banks, um, which is a you know, government-sponsored enterprise, and then the home loan lent that money back to Bank A. Bank A still has the, the deposit that left. It's just changed in terms of the form of borrowing that the bank was using. The liability that the bank had changed from a deposit to a borrowing from the federal home loan system. And as long as the money was staying within the system, we felt that banks would likely be able to find a way to get adequate liquidity and financing. Um, and again, what we were most worried about was that the money could potentially leave the banking system, not be available, um, and that um, money funds will just say, look, everything looks too scary to us. So I only want to keep my money with the Fed and I want to completely move it out of the banking system. And so that situation has improved. Uh, the reverse repo facility has been drained. And I think the composition of aggregate uh, money market fund holdings has moved as a percentage from uh, being dominated by the reverse repo to uh, the treasuries that you're talking about and uh, agency securities. What is What has been a catalyst for that? Yeah, so... Uh, we have recently seen that the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility has dropped, gosh, almost $500 billion or so uh, just in the last almost five or six weeks. Um, and the catalyst for that facility to really drop um, didn't have anything to do with banking system stress, um, but it had almost everything to do with the debt limit. Remember how six weeks or so ago, we were all worried about the possibility of a technical government default and whether or not the government would be able to pay its bills. Well, government figured out how to uh, do that. Congress helped figure out how to do that. Um, and then once the debt limit was resolved, um, Treasury ended up issuing a bunch of bills or short dated Treasury securities. And they did that because through the debt limit process, they had depleted their cash balance cash on hand that they held um, got to be very low. Essentially, the government was running on fumes, just like if you stopped you know, your ability to receive income or any inflows into your bank account, which essentially happened for the treasury, um, then you would run on fumes and you would deplete your existing bank account. Well, as soon as the debt limit was resolved, treasury wanted to rebuild that bank account. 
and they wanted to rebuild it quite quickly, understandably, because they were running on fumes. Uh, and so they ended up issuing, gosh, I guess now over $600 billion of bills since the debt limit was resolved. That money market supply has cheapened money market rate levels such that money funds feel like they can extend out the front end of the yield curve. They can buy some of this cheap money market supply and they can they can reduce the amount of cash that they've been parking with the Fed at their overnight RRP facility. So lots of plumbing here, I know, but uh, there's actually been a lot of movements uh, you know, through the financial system pipes um, uh, emanating from some of the bank stress that we had and then the debt limit. But it does appear, at least for the moment, we are in a bit of a more stable equilibrium um, and there aren't such sharp movements in where the money resides within the system, um, at least not, not happening right now um, in relation to the sharp movements that we saw over the last couple of months. Okay, thanks for breaking that down. But I love the plumbing and our, our audience does as well. Was there a time where Secretary Yellen of the, the Treasury, uh, people thought that she would issue longer term uh, securities and then she kind of, the Treasury su- surprised the market by issuing all this short term you know, cash like secu- paper? We thought the Treasury actually did a very good job of signaling their issuance intentions. Um, We uh, had long expected that once the debt limit was passed, that with the depleted cash balance, Treasury would go out and issue more short dated paper in order to rebuild its cash balance. We thought the Treasury would do that simply because, number one, bills have long acted as Treasury's financing shock absorber. So anytime they uh, encounter some type of unexpected financing need, they've tended to rely on bills to absorb that financing shock. Um, Clearly, the debt limit is seen as a financing shock, so it would make sense that they would rely a little bit more on bills. Um, But we also think the Treasury did that because they know very well that there was a lot of sidelined and pent-up demand to purchase short dated securities. And all of that sidelined and pent up demand was residing in the Fed's overnight RRP facility. And the Treasury believed for good reason, as we also did, that there would be very strong demand for the paper that they would bring to market. Uh, And as long as money funds could generate some type of modest pickup in relation to the expected path of the overnight RRP facility, that they would willingly extend out the curve. And that's what they've done. There was some talk that the Fed would have to push the money out because it was so sticky and it would never leave. We long disagreed with that view. We just thought that you needed more supply trading at slightly cheaper rates in order to pull the money out. And that's exactly what has happened. So the process has been very natural. It's been very organic. um, And it's really been money funds who are choosing to extend out the curve with adequate supply at the right rates, as opposed to that money getting forced out um, by the Fed. Right. So the reverse repo facility, it's a fixed rate by the the Fed and the Fed changes it, unlike treasury rates, which are market rates, which move based on buying and selling. So because there was so much treasury uh, bill issuance, their price went down because the supply went up. So their yields, you could get a higher yield over the reverse repo facility. What did that spread uh, look like that made it you know somewhat attractive for money market funds to leave the reverse repo facility and buy treasuries? And also, you know, tell us your thoughts about that, that spread going forward, because I, I know you have some concerns about who's just going to buy these treasuries and, and bonds going forward. Yeah. Um, so we have less concerns about who's going to buy at the front end. Uh, we'll talk about that and more concerns about who's going to buy at the back end. Um, but in terms of who's going to buy at the front end, there's still one point seven trillion dollars or so that's sitting in the Fed's RP facility. By the way, if that sounds like a big number, it's because it is. Um, It's a very large number. Remember, the average annual U.S. deficit is somewhere around 1.25 to 1.5 trillion. So there's almost one annual deficit's worth of money sitting in the Fed RP right now. So there's a lot of pent up demand still there. Now, the money funds, you're absolutely right, Jack. They are sitting in RP because they feel that it is uh, the safest alternative that they have or that they don't have adequate or compelling opportunities to extend out the curve. And this made a lot of sense when 
like for the better part of 2022 and early 23, there was an acute supply demand imbalance at the front end of the curve, where there was so much demand at the front end and insufficient supply, such that treasury bill rates traded about on average 25 or 30 basis points rich to the expected path of the federal funds rate or the expected path of the overnight RRP. So if you were a money fund, you had to ask yourself, why would I extend out the curve and lock in these relatively low yields when I can get a better deal by staying very short? And that's what they were doing. They were staying short. You know, it's kind of like that curve inversion that we were talking about earlier. Um, When the curve is inverted, you're biased to keep your money at a little bit shorter tenor. Um, And now with all of the supply that we have seen post debt limit, that's put upward pressure on money market rates, it's allowed bill rates to trade slightly cheap to the expected path of the Fed's overnight RRP facility. And right now, I would guess that if you were to ask a money fund, you know, where one month bills trade in relation to the expected overnight RRP path, they would tell you that it trades at about two to four basis points cheap. Um, If you were to ask them where three-month bills trade in relation to the expected overnight RRP path, they'd probably tell you that they trade around five to eight basis points cheap. And these are the levels that are seen as sufficiently attractive for money funds to leave the RRP and extend out the curve. Those are the rate levels that are required to pull the money out. And again, we think the Treasury will continue to provide a pretty healthy dose of bill supply for the remainder of this calendar year. Specifically, we think there's probably another $800 billion or so of additional Treasury supply that will be coming. Uh, that is going to be met with very strong demand and ongoing demand as funds leave the Fed's overnight RRP facility. So for short uh, for, for short term issuance out of the treasury. We're not too worried because we've got a lot of confidence as to who's going to buy it. And we've now seen the type of levels that will be required to clear there. We do have greater questions and see greater risks around who's going to buy the long-term treasury supply. Uh, Between the months of uh, June and December, uh, there's going to be another $650 billion of additional coupon supply hitting the market. Um, Treasury is going to increase the size of some of their coupon uh, auctions uh, we expect at the August refunding, which is in just about two weeks from now. Um, And that's going to increase the total amount of uh, of supply of long-term bonds. We have greater questions about where the demand will come from for that type of paper because it's not as obvious as pointing to the RP. And many of the traditional demand sources are just not that active right now. For us, we typically think of five demand sources, excluding the Fed. We know the Fed's doing QT right now, so they're a net seller technically. Those five sources of demand include banks. Banks aren't buying because uh, they're able to make loans and cost of funds are relatively high. And if they've got any excess borrowing, they want to pay it down. So banks aren't buying a lot of uh, securities right now. Two, uh, the foreigners, official sector, you know, foreign official or foreign private, they're not buying that many treasuries because their FX hedging costs are so high that if they want to buy a 10-year treasury, let's say, and hedge out the FX rate exposure, when you run the math on that, it becomes very, very expensive for them. A lot of that has to do with the very inverted yield curve. So foreigner demand is not particularly strong. We then think of the pension and insurance community, um, and they'll buy, but their buying is not terribly market sensitive primarily because these entities are mostly engaged in liability-driven investment strategies and they got a plan for how they're going to invest. And it's not like if 10s are at 4%, they're buying a lot, or if they're at 3%, they're not buying very much. So they're just not that sensitive. So that really leaves just two other sources of demand. One is the asset management community. And the second is the levered hedge fund community. Now, asset managers think you're broad and large investment firms. Um, They think that tens around 4% are reasonably attractive, but the asset management community, according to surveys that we do with our clients, including the asset management community, indicate to us that they're already quite long. Um, 
they have been buying and they are probably a little bit over their benchmarks in terms of what they you know want to continue to buy so that source of demand will really require some type of economic slowdown or de-risking to continue with large scale inflows into the asset management community or heaven forbid the Fed ends up hiking more because inflation is increasing and uh, their long positions are somehow underwater. So we just don't know that we can count on the asset management community for a strong source of coupon demand, demand out the curve, um, unless we realize this type of economic slowdown and and potential de-risking. So then there's really only one other obvious source of demand that's left, and that's the levered hedge fund community. And the levered hedge fund community will buy treasuries, but they need additional repo. They need additional leverage. And the more leverage demand that they have, the higher the financing costs rise, and then the greater the spreads that uh, these RV hedge funds will need to receive in order to justify that trade. And we do have questions as to how deep is the demand from the levered hedge fund community? How widely available are some of these repo balances that they will be relying on. What is the cost of leverage? Because we know that with additional bank regulations, which are coming down the pike, you would think that dealer balance sheet costs will be rising. And as a result, there is a risk that treasuries will need to be cheapening, at least cheapening in relation to so for swaps or cheapening in relation to Fed funds, OIS swaps. So that's certainly a risk that we see to the outlook. And it's fundamentally rooted in a potential building supply demand imbalance at the back end of the treasury curve. Um, so that is certainly a risk that we think about when we look at the rates market and we think about how the process of all of this supply and ongoing Fed QT will will play itself out. So the five traditional buyers for the US Treasury market, very important market, one of the largest markets in the world, you know, you're having some questions about whether they're going to be there to buy. Uh, I'm hearing that I would that, that would incline me to think that yields might go up because who are the buyers who are going to buy the, this stuff? But uh, it's my understanding that you actually have the opposite view that uh, yields on the 10 year could, could go down in a, in a sort of slow motion fashion. So why is that the case? If you think that you know there's no buyers, uh, who's going to buy them? Yeah, well, we think about, uh, at least the way I think about the treasury market, is really driven by two different factors. First is the expected federal funds rate path. What's the Fed going to do? The OIS path, as I think about it, Fed funds OIS. And that is, by and large, the single most important driver of interest rates and where interest rates will go. The second factor to then think about is, well, where are treasuries trading as a spread to the expected OIS path? Now, the economy can slow down. The Fed can be cutting rates and the OIS path can be declining, and that will move rates lower. It's not inconceivable that at the same time, you could have a supply-demand imbalance and that that spread to the federal funds rate path could be widening and could be cheapening. So when we do our rate forecasts, the single most important driver is the path of the Fed. We do think that the economy will show greater signs of moderation, slower employment growth, more signs of disinflation. That will convince the market the Fed will be cutting um, at some point, likely in 2024. That will help push longer-term interest rates lower. But we can also envision a scenario where even as that occurs, you've got this supply-demand imbalance brewing at the back end, and you're seeing treasuries as a spread to Fed funds and that expected rate path widen out. So the two are not inherently contradictory, although I can certainly understand the question as to if you're worried about supply-demand, how can you have interest rates going lower in your forecast? And the answer is we have interest rates lowering going lower on our forecast because we think that the expected path of the Fed will be shifting lower as the economy moderates. Got it. So all those reasons about the the five buyers maybe not being there, those are for why you think the spread could widen between treasuries and overnight uh, index swaps. 
but the the OIS itself will go down because of the Fed. So okay, so why do you think the Federal Reserve will will cut? And so why and and when? And, and of course, we should talk that you know since probably over a year ago, the market has been pricing in that the Federal Reserve will cut eventually, and you know so far that hasn't happened. Correct. Yeah. Um, so the uh, B of A house view, which is owned by our economists, um, does anticipate that the U.S. economy will be in a relatively mild recession uh, in the early part of next year. Now, when you ask them, they tell you, well, you know, it could be a mild recession, maybe with a 51 percent probability or a growth recession with a 49 percent probability. Um, but Look, a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth, or at least that's been the typical definition. Um, A growth recession is where you just have positive but below trend growth. Um, So they are somewhat on the fence as to exactly what type of slowdown this will be. But the overarching message from them is that it's going to be a mild one. And so you're going to have a mild economic slowdown. You're going to see the pace of hiring decelerate. We've already seen it moderate. The labor market's still very strong and very resilient by all accounts, but it has been moderating. And as that occurs, they have more confidence that you'll see inflation continue to shift lower over time. Um, But this is going to be more of the, let's say, garden variety recessions as opposed to a big, gnarly pandemic-induced recession or uh, financial crisis-induced recession like the last two have been. This is going to be not nearly as significant, we expect. Um, So when will we see clearer signs of that? We think around the turn of the year. Um, And you're already starting to see some signs that – Inflation is moderating, that uh, some of the key components of CPI are shifting lower. Used cars is a big driver in the last report. Shelter prices appear to be slowing. Services, X housing, quote unquote, super core measure of inflation was also flat. So it was flat on a month over month basis, didn't go up at all. So you're seeing signs of improvement there that we expect will persist in time. Um, And if that's right, you know, mild slowdown coupled with inflation falling, we think that the Fed will judge that it is on a path to achieve its dual mandate of stable prices and maximum employment and start cutting rates in May of next year. So think around the middle of next year. Obviously, if the growth slowdown is sharper and faster, then they'll be cutting earlier. If the growth slowdown is milder and doesn't happen for longer, it'll be later. Um, But that is our house view. Um, And it's a little bit later than what the market is pricing. Um, And uh, again, we do think that some of what the market is anticipating for the Fed is a little bit um, you know, too too many cuts too soon. And so we've been recommending clients fade the extent of those cuts at the very front end of the curve. Do you kind of envision this will look somewhat like 2019 when the Federal Reserve was uh, cutting it during a growth s- slowdown that you know, not a lot of you know, I, I, it, people were you know, talking about how bad the economy was then, but uh, it was somewhat of a growth slowdown. And it, uh, un- unlike obviously March 2020, which is emergency cuts, which I, I presume is not on your base case. <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, let's hope we never see another March 2020 scenario in any of our lifetimes. Um, uh, yeah, so the pace of cuts that we envision will look much more similar to, uh, let's say, the summer and early fall of 2019. Um, where it'll be 25 basis points a meeting, um, and that that'll continue until the Fed gets back down to neutral, which they believe is two and a half percent. The market thinks that neutral will be maybe a little bit above three percent in nominal terms, but somewhere in that zone. Um, now, of course, that makes sense from a modal forecast perspective, you know, the most likely outcome. But there's a whole host of risks around this distribution. And I think our economists would certainly tell you that if the economy slows faster than they anticipate, uh, that there's a very real risk that the Fed will end up cutting faster as well. 
so do, does that result in, I think you said bimodal, meaning that the cuts that you'd see priced into the market, they're not necessarily pricing in a 100% chance of two cuts. They're pricing in you know, an 80% chance of no cuts and a 20% chance of, of, of a lot of cuts. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, modal is, you know, the, you know, when, when you run a scenario, it's the most frequent single occurrence. Um, and when you are an economist or a rate strategist, you have to think about, well, what is the modal path? What's the most likely path uh, that we are going to see? The market prices in a average path. So it's pricing in a much wider set of distributions. And that's why even though an economist might think, well, they're only going to cut 25, the market could price something much more uh, aggressive than that, because it's pricing in, you know, yes, you know, some probability of a 25 basis point rate cut, but also some probability of a 100 basis point rate cut. Um, but that that's kind of the market, that, that's how the market operates. And that's a key difference between how an economist might operate or how uh, a market participant assessing the range of outcomes would operate. That makes sense. How do you think on a longer term about where is kind of the, the home base for the 10 year? You know, a year ago, we never would have thought it was at, at 4%. Uh, you know, in 2005, we never thought that we'd see negative rates in, in, in Europe. It's, it's very, very hard to, to guess. And I mean, how, how do you sort of think about it? Yeah. So, uh, well, we start by asking ourselves, uh, where do our economists think neutral is? Where does the Fed think neutral is? Where does the market think neutral is? Um, and look, the way we've been anticipated or the way that we've been thinking about this is that we assume that the Fed will probably average 2% inflation over time. But the risks are skewed slightly higher than that, um, just given how sticky inflation has been and given some of the broader and more structural changes in the economy. Think the war in Ukraine, think onshoring, think you know, uh, more uh, domestic investment in things like chips um, for resiliency purposes. So we think that you'll see slightly higher inflation as a result of that. And you'll probably also see slightly higher real rates as a result of that. Um, and so the Fed tells us that they think neutral is 2.5%. That's 2% inflation and 50 basis points of real rates. I'm kind of comfortable adding 25 basis points onto each one of those, assuming that neutral could be closer to three. And then we believe that there will be some type of term premia, treasury cheapening in relation to the expected Fed path, as we were just discussing, we assume that that's 25 basis points. And that's why our 10-year forecasts in the long run are at three and a quarter percent, uh, as opposed to the Fed's neutral estimate that's two and a half, or our economists that are sort of between two and a half and three percent. Got it. Do you think quantitative tightening will continue uh, for a long time. What are the circumstances? And perhaps you can speak, uh, you know, to your experience at the Fed, nearly a decade, where you kind of you know, witnessed and were, were involved in the, the birth and creation of quantitative easing of expanding the balance sheet. Uh, not now that we're doing the opposite. Yeah. Well, quantitative easing was uh, somewhat born out of necessity, um, uh, and was born out of a desire to support market functioning and ease overall financial conditions in the face of. The, uh, serious challenge to the economy. Um, back in 08, it was due to you know, banking system concerns. And in 2020, obviously, it was due to a pandemic. For QT, uh, we have long argued that QT will stop under one of three circumstances. Number one, you get an economic slowdown or a recession and rate cuts that are designed to stimulate the economy. In that state of the world, the Fed may not want to be easing on one hand by cutting rates and tightening on the other by doing QT. Um, so that's one state. Second state would be if there's some type of real market functioning issue or market functioning breakdown. And then the third state would be if the Fed can get back to what they call reserve scarcity where they've drained enough excess liquidity out of the banking system that banks are now having to compete very aggressively for funding um, and that there's just an inadequacy of reserves or cash in the overall banking system. 
Um, we think that that first condition is the most likely. And that's why, given the B of A house view for a mild recession, Fed rate cuts in May of next year, we, in our base case, have QT stopping in May. But it's certainly possible that we don't encounter that recession, or it's possible that the Fed just says, hey, even though we're cutting to offset a mild recession, we want to keep QT running. It's not contradictory in their view. Um, if one of those scenarios occurs, we think that the Fed won't hit this concept of reserve scarcity until very deep into 2025 or maybe early 2026. And in the numbers that we run, very consistent with the Fed and their own modeling that they publish, or at least the New York Fed publishes on their balance sheet, the uh, balance sheet reduction doesn't stop until really the second half of 2025, um, probably, you know, kind of September-ish uh, of 2025. Um, so if we can avoid a recession and the need for uh, stimulative monetary policy, if we can avoid, avoid a severe market functioning issue, then QT can indeed run for a long time. And one of the things that give, gives QT its ability to run for so long is the fact that we've seen the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility drop so sharply and drop so quickly. Now, we long thought that you would see RRP drop quickly once you got the money market supply and once money funds wanted to extend out the curve. Um, and the pace of RRP reduction is about what our forecasts had predicted. Um, and so QT can certainly run for longer as long as we see that continued reduction in money fund RRP utilization, which we do expect if you can avoid that bad recession or if you can avoid that bad market functioning issue. Thanks. So uh, you know you and your team have written about how you – think uh, a steepener play, a bull steepener play, that's okay. But what you actually think might be better is buying the 10-year, as we talked about. Can you just square why you think the 10-year would do better than something shorter term? Yeah. So we think that um, the 10-year is just a cleaner and easier expression as an end-of-cycle trade than anything on the curve. Um, because when you get towards the end of a cycle, you can have a couple of different dynamics at play. You can have a dynamic where, okay, we all see the data turn at the same time, and it's clear that the Fed uh, needs to uh, stop uh, tightening and start easing. And then you get the cl classic bull steepener where rates go down, but front end rates go down by more than long end rates. But another dynamic that you can see at the end of a cycle is a bull flattener, which occurs when the market sees something that it doesn't like in the economy, or there's some type of risk off in the market for whatever reason. The Fed is still holding on to a desire to you know, want to keep policy tight, and that risk off uh, allows the back end to rally by more than the front end. So given that you could see either one of those scenarios play out, we think that the duration play is clearer than the curve trade. We also think if you look at where the curve is priced and, and, and where rates are priced in the forwards, so what the market is expecting, and remember, if you want to win when you invest, you got to beat the forwards. Um, we just think that there's so much steepening price. So there's a much higher bar for the steepener to work. There's a much lower bar for an outright duration view to work. And that's why we've been recommending that clients um, – we would we would recommend clients express their end of cycle trades more so in duration as opposed to the curve. And that's a, a nice you're kind of uh, combining two views of the, the mild recession view in 2024, but that the Federal Reserve doesn't react and that it's higher for longer. Correct. That's right. And look, I mean, the Fed has been quite clear, we think, about their intention to keep rates higher for longer, um, to uh, not necessarily acquiesce to what the market expects in terms of cuts. Um, and again, there is the risk that the Fed might overdo it. And at some point, you get that type of bull flattener, that sort of last 
gasp move on the curve before the Fed ultimately relents. Um, but we just think that being along the back end, again, it's it, it, it guards against both of those curve scenarios that I just discussed. And it works in an environment where uh, you do have so much that's priced for steepening in the forwards and so little that's priced in duration terms. So again, we just think the duration play is cleaner and easier at the end of the cycle as opposed to the curve trade. Uh, thank you. So my, my final question is about something w- way over my head about the uh, SEC's rule on money market funds. <laughs> uh, you just wrote a note about the different uh, new new rules. So first I want to tell it tell us uh, what what are the new rules what problems are they they solving and then i might just sort of spoil the ending for our listeners here and say that uh, in the l- latter part of the report you say the sec rule does not address the source of 2020 market stress so why not yeah sure okay well look your listeners much real must really love the weeds if they've lasted this long into money fund reform but as somebody who thinks a lot about funding markets this type of stuff is important um, and i i'm greatly appreciative of any listeners that have stuck with us uh, to this point so last week the sec did come out with a finalization of some of their money market rules um, and these rules did a number number of things, but if I can just really highlight the two most important, number one, they did away with the possibility that a gate could potentially be imposed upon an investor at any point in time. And a gate is if you put your money into a mutual fund and then you want to take it out, the mutual fund then has the ability to say, nope, you can't get your money. I'm putting a gate down. That is a thenema to many users of money market mutual funds because they value these vehicles for their liquidity um, attributes um, and a gate runs really counter to that. So it did away with the gate, which was encouraging, but it imposed a liquidity fee, meaning that if you want to take your money out, And if a bunch of other investors want to take their money out on a certain day and you cross a threshold where there's 5% of total fund assets or more, then you are subject to a fee for getting your funds out. It's almost like a tax to withdraw your money. And the SEC did this to try and reduce what it saw as a first mover advantage in periods of market stress where somebody would say, hey, this market doesn't feel right. I'm going to get my money out quickly. Um, Because if you get your money out too quickly, you might trip that fee or you might trip that threshold and then be subject to that liquidity fee or tax in order to get your money back. So we do think that the imposition of the fee will discourage certain users to stay in the prime money market mutual fund product. Um, And it will certainly help reduce that first mover advantage. Um, It'll probably help cheapen up front end credit as uh, you see those outflows. Um, But that is really a story for the second half of 2024, which is when we think that this rule will ultimately be implemented. Um, But we do think that the ruling doesn't fully address all of the issues that we saw during the market stress of March and April 2020. Because in March and April of 2020, you had a dash for cash. This rule doesn't prevent that dash for cash from occurring. And in that dash for cash, you had short-term investment vehicles that were selling securities into a marketplace that did not have adequate ability to intermediate. And what happened was there were a lot of entities that were selling securities into dealers. Dealers then had their balance sheets bloat to the point where they could take no additional risk. And then there was no end buyer for the paper that had just been sold. And essentially what happened was the dealer balance sheets froze. The market froze because of that. And the market making formulation process was unable to work because there were all sellers and no buyers. The SEC rules, in our view, don't adequately address that risk, and we could still see that some of the market dynamics that occurred in 2020 happen again in the future in another dash for cash scenario. Yes, 
you've reduced the first mover advantage. You've also uh, allowed a uh, provision that prevents dilution of existing shareholders. And those are laudable goals, but they don't get to the underlying issue that drove some of the short-term money market stress in March of 2020. Um, it's probably beyond the scope for the SEC to do that, uh, but nonetheless, we don't think that these rules go f- go far enough to ensure that that type of market event never happens again. Thank you, Mark. And we definitely do have some listeners that have stuck around to the end. So thank you so much for, for sharing your, your insights. You, re- you really understand the plumbing and uh, great to hear your, your view on rates. Uh, you know, other than, I guess, you know, folks have a Bloomberg terminal, they can look, look up you and your team. But any other way for them to get in touch with, with the rates team? or? Uh, yeah, well, if you're a client, um, it really helps. Um, in particular, if you work for a a company that does business with Bank of America, or if you work for an institutional investor that does business with Bank of America, um, that's the best way to ensure that you can get our research. Um, and if you'd like to be signed up, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and uh, we'll be happy to make that happen, assuming that you meet those key criteria. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.